so he developed his own following, which took him about six, maybe to a couple of months to develop, simply because of his um, uninhibited type of attitude and playing. He played any and everything. He was the type of person that he would test and do anything in terms of musically. Whereas Frankie didn't quite be as risky or risque about things as he as he was, you know. Um, he played things like uh, different tracks. He played like this song uh, from the Rudy Ray Moore comic uh, album called Since She Was a Black Woman. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it's quite wild. Him being that type of person, it attracted a lot of people in the underground scene who wanted their music heard, which they may sometimes couldn't take to Frankie because Frankie did not want to be bothered with it. Okay. He was more professional in terms, Frankie Knuckles was a little more professional in terms of what he played and more particular about certain things, you know, culture-like, you know, Ron wasn't. He was one of those DJs that I, I was, just for example, I was in the DJ booth with him one evening. The, the room was packed, 400 tightly squeezed in, screaming out his name. We were engulfed into a conversation. The record had went off completely, played out. And you know the sound of the ending of the record, which went The people went mad when they heard that because they thought that was a sound effect that he was creating. So I said, Ron, the record's gone. He said, oh, what the hell? So he went over to the other turntable and blended in my name while it was going he blended in a sound effect record which was Bessie Smith and it said my name is Bessie Smith and kept repeating that my name is Bessie Smith and that went into a track the people almost tore the walls down Ron Hardy was such an important aspect because Ron really showed the element of the remix. He showed how to put, for the Chicago kids and for the Midwestern kids, he showed how to put together a Stevie Wonder track, flip it upside down, make it go backwards, add little crazy beats to it, speed it up. That was part of his creative genius, as we know it today. He's also done things like picked up the, char the tone arm of the turntable and accidentally dropped it on the record and it bounced across the record. And the people also again said, ooh, what was that? Because they already are hyped. He's already got them on 10. So when that happened, he just, hmm. He went over and did the other turntable the same way. He did this for about a couple of minutes, bouncing the needle across the turntables. And along while this was going on, he said, press that button over there on that reel, which brought out another record, which he slowly oozed in while this was going on, while he was toying with the turntable and then the tone arm bouncing across the record, skipping. You know, uh, he would bring in something like Dr. Love while this was going on, which people, or maybe some song like Bad Luck at a certain particular part of it, which people went ape by this point. So he had a lot of genius. I've gone record shopping with him before, and we stopped one day in a jazz record shop, and he said, I said, what are you doing in here? No house music in here, no things in here. He said, I want this old jazz tune my father had. 
So the name of the record I remember was Meet Me With Your Black Draws On. I thought that was wild. I said, what the hell is this? What are you going to do with this? He said, it's a certain segment I have to play. It was just his genius. He played Ray Charles. Now these are two 18 year old, 19 year old kids that's never been exposed to this type of music. Um, he recreated James Brown uh, music. He played uh, Ain't It Funky Now and uh, a couple of other tunes by him. He had his signature James Brown tune that he played all the time that they never played in New York, but they played here because of Ron Hardy. Uh, what happened with his music, it was a transition also because of his chemical dependence. It changed his mindset accidentally and, and created a style for him because the particular dependence that he was on made music sound slower. So it created, he speeded it up to equate how it should sound in his mind, which created a different style, like many of our other famous artists. Okay, so today we are not to say that he would have been still chemically dependent. I don't know. But, as a master technician that he was, he became aware of this particular thing, but he enjoyed it because it created such high energy in the room in which he played. So he had no particular reason for abandoning his newfound friend, and that was the uh, music strobe on the third day was to speed it up. I don't know when he really realized it. And if he did realize, I know he did realize it, but he didn't care because of the response of his audience. They loved him. The breeding of house music, Ron Hardy was one of the most influential persons to develop those type of skills, along with Frank Knuckles. But aside from that, uh, you cannot mention house music without associating it with Ron Hardy. Actually, there were only two people who names can be even labeled with house music in terms of its development and its creativity, and that was Ron Hardy and Frankie Knuckles. Aside from that, there were the other people were what I would call um, his interns, people who came up under them, who were his followers, who were Frank's followers and who were Ron followers, younger guys, like Jesse Sanders, like Steve Sid Curley, uh, they, Farley Keith, uh, Larry Hurd, definitely. Robert Owen. Ron Hardy, for instance, created his own, his own within beat that would manifest into all those kids that came to hear him play. And all those kids wanted to sound like Ron. And it came across in the music that they would eventually put out. You know, because of his idea of a remix, which never left the club. Because I think Ron Hardy did maybe two or three remixes that ever hit vinyl. Other than that, you had to go hear him play to hear these mutated and crazy ass mixes. You never would hear it anywhere. He, he, he was such a such a, a character. The music would never leave the club. You know, he just wasn't wasn't that organized to ever ever get it together like that. Ron Hardy was here in Chicago and he became hospitalized, you know, uh, fighting off his illness. But he needed round the, more round the clock nurturing in terms of his health situation. So his mother did not want him to stay here with just 
roommates trying to see after him. So she came to Chicago and retrieved her son and took Ron back to Springfield with her. And that's where he remained until his passing.